you know, our ministry is headquartered in, in Texas. And one thing about Texas, you know, it's like there's three churches here. There's like one over here. Uh, it's like it's way over. And then, and then you guys over here, you're like at the reject table over here on this side. Just a few ones over there and then the main ones. So I'll, I'll try not to ignore anybody here. Have any, has anybody ever noticed that um, Texans love to brag? I oh, mean, I'm not from Texas and I'm not from California, but when you go to Texas, everything is Texas. Texas this, Texas that, Texas burgers, Texas cars, Texas everything. And they, they, kind, of, they kind of look down their nose at the rest of their country on those things. And one state in particular, they look down their nose at, and it's what? California. <laughs> I have to tell you, it, I rejoice every time I see Texas in my rearview mirror and I am on my way to California. There is no place like this place. No place. My wife and I are on our 44th wedding anniversary and um, yeah, praise the Lord. I, sorry, 45, 45. Um, uh, and right after we first got married, we went out to San Jose and it, in March. And we were up in the Black Hills. It was a little chilly there. And man, it was so glorious, so glorious. So thank you for the invitation. It's just a wonder to, uh, wonderful to be here. You know how blessed you guys are, not just for living in California, but you have church leadership. You have a pastor who cares enough about you. He cares about you. He cares about your kids. Clearly, he cares about some of your grandkids here to bring in people who are going to reinforce you on the most important issue, which is the basis for the doctrine of God himself, which we sang about all this morning. And it is under attack, it's under attack, mostly by a scientific realm where people think that they have found evidence that they can really disprove God on that. But that's not true, and that's why we have our ministry, and that's why it's so important. So, just a few years ago, I did a debate. I did a debate with two other groups, Biologos and Reasons to Believe, not too far from here. Do you know where a suburb called El Segundo is? El Segundo. So I did a debate at El Segundo. It was, it was moderated by Sean McDowell, and he came up with three key questions that he specifically wanted us to ask and address in the debate. And we did. These are great questions that every Christian should have an answer to. So if you have a pen and paper with you, pen and paper, this would be a great message to take a few notes on because we are going to do a whiteboard talk, a whiteboard in church. Everybody can see the whiteboard there and I'm gonna be able to move and write on it. So as you can see, it, it moves. So we're gonna be able to zero in I hope everybody over here can at least see this screen and, and you guys over here, over there, you can see one of the screens because we're going to zip in and we're going to answer these three questions. The questions were this. One, how do you interpret and understand Genesis 1 and 2? Do you think you should have an answer to that question? How do you interpret? How do you understand Genesis 1 and 2? Somebody might ask you that question. I ran into a preacher just a little while ago. He said he hasn't touched the book of Genesis in over 20 years. Shame on him. Shame on him. How do you understand and interpret Genesis 1 and 2? We're going to give an answer to that. Number two, what is your take on Darwinian evolution? It's actually two questions rolled in one. They kind of cheated. So this is 2A. What is your take on Darwinian evolution? And 2B, its compatibility with Christian faith. That's a great question. Somebody may come up to you and ask, what's your take on evolution as compatibility with Christian faith? And number three is, are you open to the natural world pointing to design? Are you open to the natural world pointing to design? That's a great question. That is a really great question. And since I was in California and I wanted to be a little counter-cultural, I'm going to start with question number three first. And that threw the people off in the debate really well. You know why? It's because people think that science has proved that there isn't any design, that people struggle with questions two and questions one. So let's look and answer those. So question number three first. 
There it is. You can see it up on the board, and bang, I'm going to write real fast with a little black marker right up there. Are you open to the natural world pointing to design? You know, an even better word than design is engineering. It's engineering. Your body and all these creatures are highly, highly engineered. And so I gave a question, I gave an answer to that, and this was my answer. Well, of course, yes, I'm from the Institute for Creation Research. Of course, I'm open to the natural world pointing to design, not just out in space, but more specifically and more gloriously to the engineering found in living creatures. That is really, really cool. And then I said, yes, not only yes, but I said, it's the workmanship. The workmanship in living things is best explained by intelligent design. Now, the word workmanship is picked on purpose. In fact, you even mentioned it today when Mr. B, who called me Dr. G, read Psalm 19. It's there. It's there. It's workmanship. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And we almost always stop right there. Don't stop. And the firmament shows his what? Handiwork. His handiwork. That's workmanship. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are what? Made. You know that word made is used only one other time in the New Testament, the Greek word, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So what that is saying is, that's just not poetic language. That is saying when we look at living creatures, we should see evidences of workmanship. Now, when you look at this little clicker in my hand that I use to advance my slides, does it show evidences of workmanship? Everybody sees it, but if I were to ask you to tell me what you see, you may not be able to see it. What you see here are multiple parts working together for a purpose. Multiple parts working together for a purpose. And every time you see that, it only comes from one source, a mind, an intelligent mind. So when you look at me, do you see multiple parts? I mean incredibly multiple, <laughs> glorious parts, all working together for a purpose? Yes, you do. You see all of those parts on that. My wife is shaking her head. But anyway, I, I think I've got multiple parts. So we have all of these parts working together for a purpose. Now, there are so many areas in biology that I could focus on. I want to focus on one area in particular, which is really where the creation evolution debate is at. It's how organisms adapt, how organisms adapt. And I know exactly what you've been taught in school over all these years, that over periods of time, during copying errors, DNA is copied wrong, and you get those mistakes, and those mistakes are called what? Mutations, mutations, copying errors. And so sometimes some of these copying errors are really, really good. And as organisms struggle to survive, called natural selection, the ones with the good copying mistakes reproduce and they go on to develop their, develop their offspring. And that's called the mutation selection explanation. Do you know what that is? Stupid. It is absolutely stupid. Nobody in their right mind would even think of such as that. The only reason why it isn't advanced, and we will talk about this in Sunday school, it is because it is so anti-engineering by nature. It's because it is anti-engineering by nature that anybody even says this. It's the pushback against the design and creatures. Well, let me give you how they really adapt. And it's, I know you have never heard this. This is absolutely new. Even if you've been following creation for decades, this is a new way, but this is scientifically current. It's up to date, and it glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. So, God created creatures to be, multiple, to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Would that even include caves? The answer is yes, it does. Are caves kind of a tough environment? Yes, they are. Do you know what? Sometimes fish that live in streams with eyes and pigmentation get washed into caves. And that is a very challenging environment. And when you find them later on living in the caves, they don't have eyes. They're blind and their pigmentation is gone. And many other things have, have changed on them. The question is, 
How does that happen? How does that happen? Does it take millions and millions of years? Is it random genetic mutations fractioned out by natural selection? The answer is no. Because these are the words, if you were to read the scientific papers that I'm reading, these words up here are the words that characterize adaptation. Rapid, usually very rapid. Regulated, in fact, most papers say highly regulated. Repeatable, sometimes reversible, and with traits that are so targeted to solve the specific environmental challenges, they're even predictable. Now, what you just read is the exact opposite of what you learned in school. Not slow, not gradual, not random, not hit and miss, not trial and error, none of those kinds of things. Highly regulated, rapid, repeatable, sometimes even reversible, and with targeted, predictable solutions. Now, do those words sound like something an engineer would build? Yes, they do. The words that we're actually reading in real scientific papers are consistent with engineering. So I want to take on three of Darwin's icons right here, and the first one is the cave fish. I mean, the cave fish were supposed to explain how evolution works. But this is what we've actually found, and this is just one of dozens and dozens of papers that I could point to. These fish can lose their eyes in a single generation. And they can, they can either gain or lose their pigmentation in a single generation. In fact, we have taken some of these at, at ICR where we're doing research, we have taken some of these hypopigmented, kind of pinkish looking fish, which you see right up, right up here, for those on the other side, these pink looking fish, and we put them back in simulated river conditions and they regain their pigmentation in about 30 days. Wow, that's what you should be saying, wow. How does that happen? They have sensors in their body that detect the sun. Information is sent in. It turns on pigmentation cells and bang, they start to produce pigmentation. Not only that, their offspring even develop it even faster. And during development, when the eye degenerates, the offspring are holding on to their eye longer and longer. And it's happening rapidly. Wow. How about this? This is, another, oh, this is another place where you can come up with truth. I just threw this in. I know many of you don't get out to Texas that often, but if you do, this Discovery Center of ours is really going to present to you current, scientifically current information. So if you're there, this is like a free advertisement, come and visit this. It really is a bulwark for biblical truth. Now onto that second icon. Darwin's finches. Again, you've heard the same story that over time mutations led to changes in their beaks and they got bigger or smaller and that they were fractioned out by natural selection. Wrong again. Scientists have been following these finches for a long time and they've noticed that they've divided into two separate populations. One population is still living out in the wild eating typical finch food they're called the rural finches, and another population has moved into the city and they're kind of eating like human garbage food that we throw all across the ground. They're the urban finches. I don't know who you guys are. But anyway, you have these rural finches and the urban finches. And studying the urban finches, they noticed that the beaks could change within two generations. And not only did the beaks change within two generations, other parts on their body changed, which made them better suited to living in the urban area. And as they studied the DNA, there were no, no genetic mutations. In fact, there were really no genetic changes. It was another level of regulation where other molecules can be placed on the DNA, regulating how different genes are expressed. That's called epigenetic regulation. And here's the paper that researched them for those who are the real scientific purists right over there. Epigenetic variations between urban and rural populations of Darwin's finches, and you can see the differences in their finch beaks right there. And this is a little quote from the paper. It points out that growing evidence suggests, growing evidence suggests that epigenetic mechanisms may also be involved in rapid adaptation to new environments. 
Something that's completely different than what you've been told about changes in your genes, you don't even have to change the genes. There are other mechanisms which change the regulation of those genes. And speaking of epigenetic changes, here's another one of Darwin's icons, the old peppered moths. And we're told the story that you had those white moths which dominated the population and then those dirty old British started burning coal. They sooted up all their buildings. The white moths stood out like a sore thumb. The birds ate them and boom, it was natural selection and happened. You ended up with a population of black moths. Wrong again. This paper, published in 2016 in the world's leading scientific journal, Nature, noted that there was a genetic modification, it's actually an epigenetic modification, which led these moths to automatically turn black. And your DNA is not static. Some of you guys are kind of static, but your DNA is not static. Do you know there's tiny little cellular machines that can go in through your DNA, snip out a portion of it, in this case, a really big portion of the DNA, and it relocates it and pastes it back in. And where it cuts it out and pastes it in, it regulates the expression of the genes. And of these black moths, over 95% of them have a piece of that DNA that's been cut out and inserted right at the spot which regulates black color during development, automatically turning them black. Hmm. Hmm. That's quite remarkable. That doesn't sound like random mistakes, does it? it sounds like a highly purposeful, oh, oh, by the way, of the white moths, zero have that insertion. None. The man in the lower left-hand corner this paper written by him, epigenetic control of mobile DNA as an interface between life experiences. You know what this is saying? Someone, and that someone was the Lord Jesus Christ, engineered not just your DNA, he engineered all the machinery so that it can be regulated rapidly and purposefully and with targeted responses. You know, I'm looking over the audience when I did the debate and they're like, I never heard this stuff. What's wrong with my professors? You know what's wrong with the professors? They're 30 years out of date. You know what's wrong with the textbooks? They're out of date. You know what's wrong with most creationists? We're out of date. This is how change happens in a highly regulated, modulated way. And they can be quite dramatic. If you go up north where Minnesotans do the ice fishing, you know what? I lived in Minnesota, that's where I went to medical school, and I can tell you this about Minnesotans, they hate the summer. You know, they, they kind of hate summer. Everything that they live for happens in the winter. Like this happy man right there catching, what kind of fish is that? That is a, it's a big pike. It's a northern pike, it's a predator fish. And it will eat a carp, it'll eat a bass, it'll eat a trout, it'll eat, you know, they, they've actually bit people on that. And as long as this pike is eating a bass or a trout, the little carp living in the lake don't care. But if that pike ate one of those carp, like right here, boom, eats this carp, for those over here, boom, digests it and puts carpy little vapors into the water, the other carp can detect those vapors of their digested cousin and within one day, one day, they begin to morph into a different shape that's taller and thicker and harder for pike to eat. Hmm, that's quite remarkable. Sensors that could detect this purposefully adjusted responses. Oh, here's another fish. This one's kind of cool. So we go from Minnesota down to the Caribbean. This is called a reef race. A reef race, W-R-A-S-S-E. -S -S -E. The male is that colored one, and the female is the yellow. And usually there's a little school where there's like one male and 10 to 15 females, and that male kind of services those females. So what happens if the male dies or a fisherman comes by and fishes out the male? What are those lonely females to do? Hmm? Well, Usually the largest female in the school, she can detect that the male is gone and within one day's 
Her ovaries regress, she grows testes, and she morphs into a male. Wow, that's quite remarkable. Quite remarkable there. What females have wanted to do for years, I mean, <laughs> actually happens here on all of that. All these gals in the audience shaking your head on them. Come on. Wow. Incredible. Oh, here's another one. Mice can warn sons and grandsons of dangers via sperm. How in the world does that happen? Well, if you were a biologist at maybe one of these California schools, they took a bunch of male mice and they put them on a metal pad. The metal pad was electronic and they could shock their feet painfully but not lethally. And they would expose these males to cherry blossom odor and shock their feet. Expose and shock, expose and shock, 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 shock. And then they take these male mice and they mate them with female mice which have never been exposed to cherry blossom odor. So those males, every time they got an exposure to cherry blossom odor, they shocked their feet. She had pups and these scientists sacrificed the pups immediately upon birth and they stained through the olfactory region looking for bulbs and nerves and they stained blue. And this is what it looks like. On the left-hand side are the staining of the controls, olfactory bulbs, here are the nerves, and these offspring never had a dad exposed to cherry blossom odor. Over here are the offspring of the dad who was exposed to cherry blossom odor, and there's over a 200% increase in olfactory bulbs specific for guess what? Cherry blossom odor. That means these sons have been sensitized to something that their dad was exposed to, and that information was passed on, as it says, via the sperm, by these epigenetic mechanisms. Wow, does that sound like random mutations and all that other kind of stuff? And that's why I said that was so foolish. So what is really happening is organisms are adapting by the same engineering principles in which a man-made adaptable thing adapts. So I put a picture up there of a cruise control because everybody understands cruise controls are adaptable. They adjust the speed of cars. And you know what? Here's three things I need you to memorize. All adaptable things have three parts. One, they must have a sensor, a sensor that tells them what's happening. Could you adjust if you don't know what's happening? No. So you must have a what? Let's repeat it back. A sensor. Two, you must have if-then logic. If this condition, then respond this way. Does that make sense? If the car is slowing down, then actuate the throttle. And then you must have an output response, which in the car is the throttle. So you must have a sensor, if-then logic, and an output response. What do you have to have? Sensors, if-then logic, and output responses. If any one of those is, are missing, you will not adapt. Do you know what the Lord built into creatures? Sensors, if-then logic, and output responses. And that is how organisms adapt. Wow, it's quite remarkable. It's completely different. And organisms are like this space shuttle which can go through all of these different environments, solve all of the challenges of all of those environments, and you know what? The solutions to the problems precede the challenges. The Lord built the solutions to the problems in the creatures before they face the challenges. They're not due to the challenges, they precede the challenges. Everything the evolutionists are telling us are wrong. It's wrong from a scientific standpoint. So what we actually have are creatures with sensors to detect and systems that can track, enabling them to continuously track their environment, everything from rapid physiological changes to multi-generational changes, and it is a highly engineered, highly regulated mechanism that gives them rapid, targeted responses. Now does that glorify the Lord Jesus? You better believe it does. He is a genius. He is wise. And it is, it is seen abundantly in these systems. Does the whole idea of random genetic mistakes 
fractioned out through struggles to survive, does that honor anybody? No, it doesn't. This is why this is so important. So now in the debate, I've answered this question, am I open to seeing design? The answer is yes, and I just dumped on their heads example after example after example of highly designed systems, and I've introduced into their thinking something that they have never heard before, which is the exact opposite of what they're taught in school. You know what, I hate to say it's the exact opposite of what most even creationists are teaching. These are not broken things. When, when evolutionists, when they see a genetic change, you know what their default way of interpreting is? It is a mistake, it is broken, it is a loss of information, it is random. That's how they immediately interpret it, and there's no test for any of those things. You know how I interpret it? Not random, purposeful. Not broken, changed. Just changed. Does that make it, does you know what I'm saying? When you call it broken, you're characterizing it. It's just a change. And it is highly, highly regulated. It's not an accident. They push that accident broken stuff because it, it's, it's absolutely essential to their anti-design, anti-engineering narrative. Not because these are observation-based conclusions. Now that was worth the price of admission today. I, I hope from this day on, even if I stopped the message here, and I'm not, but even if I did, you have been fundamentally changed that you will never see creatures the same again. You will never think about adaptation the same again. This is a new day in your life. You will see creatures as active, problem-solving entities which take on their challenges, solve them, enabling them to fill the earth all to the glory of Christ. They're not passive modeling clay. Wow. Okay, where can you hear about that? In our state-of-the-art exhibits at our Discovery Center. So if you get out to Dallas, please come by and visit. I think you and your kids, your grandkids will be blessed if you do. That brings us to the second question. What is your take on Darwinian evolution and its compatibility with Christian faith? So here's an answer. It's, it's a really good answer, because it's mine. Anyway, <laughs> right here. Darwinian evolution is a weak scientific theory, and it is a poor explanation for the design we see in living things. Everybody has to deal with this design. Creatures look designed. Evolution is a bad explanation for that design. Number two, this part B, the basic premises of the theory cannot be reconciled with, and I added one word, biblical Christian faith. Biblical Christian faith. Why is it a weak scientific theory? And I'll cover a couple of these in the Sunday school class in more depth when I have more time. One, if you're gonna talk about the origin of life, you have to get life going. You have to get life going and nobody, nobody on this planet has a rational, reasonable explanation for the origin of life. Not even close. And we will drill down into that in Sunday school in a little bit. So they don't have an explanation anywhere about how life got going. Second, if evolutionary theory was true, not only you have to get life going, but you have to be able to change it from one kind of creature to a fundamentally different kind of creature. And as far as we know, by every human observation, with no exceptions, that's pretty good scientific evidence. Every time we've observed organisms reproduce, without a single exception, they always reproduce after their kind. Always. The Bible is right. So you can't get it going. Nobody has ever seen a change. That's why it's weak. It's contrary to all many observations. On the left-hand side is what we, what we would expect to see if evolution is true. Life beginning very simply as a single cell, and over long periods of time it branches out to all the diversity of life on Earth to where we find all of the different major body plans in the upper rock layers. Wrong. You essentially find all 
of the major body plans, I'm talking about soft body creatures, hard body creatures, vertebrates, invertebrates, all of those things, in the lowest layers where life is found. The lowest layers. So they were completely wrong about that. I was told in school that similar features were due to common ancestry, that our parents had those features and therefore I have those features and that's why we have them. Wrong. You can see there that you have a, a shark, which is a fish, and a, a dolphin, a mammal. They have very similar features, but they've been separated by evolution by hundreds of millions of years. Wrong on that. Humans and squids have similar features. In fact, even the genes for echolocation for certain bats and for dolphins and certain whales, those genes are identical. Are identical. Why would that happen? Why would you expect that? Why do they match? There's no common ancestry here, so they were wrong about that. They were wrong about a whole host of other things they put in their textbooks, which they've been wrong for for decades. I was taught as a student in school that my appendix was a worthless organ. But in the early 1990s, when I was in medical school, I saw that it was part of the immune system. The tailbone, which I was taught in school, was a remnant of my primitive ape-like ancestor that we're all sitting on, is very, very useful. In fact, it's holding muscles in your pelvic floor right now, which I'm glad all of yours are working on those things. I was taught that little babies, as they're developing in the, as an embryo, they express gill slits. Wrong on that. There are little folds on the neck, which develop into other structures on your chin and your neck. Never have gill tissue. Never. Totally wrong on all of those things. They were wrong about DNA, which they didn't know what it coded for, calling it junk. The more we study it, the more we find that it's highly important because it regulates other DNA. So they were completely wrong about that, and junk DNA was supposedly a very good evidence for evolution and evidence against design. Wrong again. They were wrong about humans and chimps being 98, 99% genetically similar. When you look at large stretches of DNA, we're down around the 80% similarity. Way off on that. Totally wrong. Why doesn't anybody call them out on all of these major blunders and mistakes that they've made? They were, you know, over here, this is what I was taught when I was a kid, when I was small, that Neanderthals were these hairy, brute ape men, cave men, half human, half ape. Totally wrong. Now that we're able to study them more closely and sequence DNA, Every one of us in this room has Neanderthal DNA. That means humans and Neanderthals were both human and they mated with each other. You just had to be careful when you did it. But that's what it means on all of those kinds of things. I hate scientific theories which rely so much on imagination. Look at this. Look at this artist's rendition of a famous fossil called Lucy. Look closely at her face. I guarantee you, if you put a little lipstick on her, she, she would look an awful lot like a Texan in many, many ways on that. Oh, it's so good to hear Texas joke dad on those things. But here's where the imagination jumps in. This is the artist's rendition, but here are the bones. Can you see, can you see a lot of imagination inserted between that, well, that was the 1970s, nobody would do it. Not true. 2015, another fossil, Homo naledi, was discovered. The artist's rendition is on the left, the bones are on the right. You can see a tremendous amount of imagination. All of these reasons are why evolution is a weak scientific theory. You can't get it wrong that many times when you spoke so authoritatively that you were right and not be a crummy theory. I don't know why we don't just trumpet this and why this isn't taught to the students as they enter UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Irvine, Riverside. There's a lot of UC schools. But these evolutionary predictions have been wrong over and over and over again. So why is it now incompatible with Christian faith? Why can't we reconcile it with Christian faith? Well, let's just talk about the first human being, Adam. Here is a book published in 1960 called Adam's Ancestor by Lewis and Mary Leakey. They both passed away. I heard about them when I was a kid. Both of them are atheists. 
Neither one of them believed that there was ever a real Adam, as portrayed in the Bible, which was the progenitor of mankind, of which a woman was made from his side. They didn't believe that at all. And they gave all of the reasons why that kind of thinking was wrong, even though they called it Adam's ancestor. So they laid out all of the atheistic evolutionary evidence for why there really wasn't a real human named Adam. And that same evidence is picked up by theistic evolutionists. In fact, there's really not a dime's worth of difference between what atheistic evolutionists believe and theistic evolutionists believe. Theistic evolutionists just tack on God intervening at times which nobody can detect. But they believe it. So why is this wrong? Why is it different? Well, in just three major areas. First of all, the Bible says that how Adam was created was by a direct creation by God. God took the dust of the earth and he formed Adam and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Theistic and atheistic evolution, completely opposite. That we descended from some ape-like ancestor. The Bible says that who Adam was, he was the very first human and that you could identify him, that there really was a real man who lived in real history, which is identified truly in Genesis, whose name was Adam. Evolutionary said you can never find that person. That person is indeterminate because they descended from a population, which is also contrary to what the Bible teaches, that Adam and Eve were the very first human beings, and that all of us are descendants from Adam and and Eve. So they're clearly wrong on how, when, and all these things about Adam being created. But this is the biggie. If I were to take the time and we were to look up all of these passages from Genesis all the way to 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible would teach very, very clearly that there was a real man named Adam who really sinned, who brought real judgment and real death to everybody who's ever lived on this planet, therefore everybody who has ever been here needs a real savior. Is that important? You better believe it's important. It means the entire world is completely under condemnation. Whether they, have, whether they sinned in the same way as Adam or not, and everybody on this planet needs a real savior. That is why it's incompatible, but here's another one. I'm gonna talk about two more which are never really brought up by creationists, but they should be. What you see on the left is the typical depiction of survival of the fittest. It's a dog-eat-dog world, it's a death-driven world, and, and Darwin ends his book about nature being red and tooth and claw and the extinction of one creature leading to the succession of another creature and in some perverse way he concludes that there is a grandeur in this view of life that somehow his world view of death and struggling survival of the fittest is glorious and wonderful and another fellow californian that you had his name was steve jobs founder of apple when he was passing away of pancreatic cancer, he gave a commencement address at Stanford University. And he said this to there, death, you can read it, it's kind of a purple word there, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. And so this is a worldview. That's why Darwin said there's a grandeur in this view of life. It is a worldview, and it is a death-focused, death-driven worldview that all of the good things have come about by the death and struggle and extinction of something before it. This is incompatible with Christian faith, fundamentally incompatible, because the Bible doesn't say that death is the best invention of life. The Bible says that death is a curse. The Bible says that death is an enemy. The Bible says that death is going to be one day destroyed altogether. As you look at the picture on the left up there on the screen, have you become comfortable with that view of life? Do you watch the nature shows where they go from one animal being eaten to another, to another, to another? You know what, Christians, believers, when we see something like that, that should be gross. That should be disgusting. 
We should, we should see that for what it really is, evidence of the curse. And we, of all people on this planet, should be looking for the day when that is destroyed. And it is gone forever. It is not the best thing that life has ever made. That's why it's incompatible. Oh, creationists, we need to stand up and trumpet that. The worldviews are not even there. And here's another element of their worldview. They see things that clearly look like design, but their worldview says you must suppress that intuition that when you see something that looks designed, that it really wasn't designed. So what you see up on the screen are a pair of what? Gears. They're gears. They're real gears. In fact, these gears are microscopic gears. These gears connect the tiny legs of this creature called a plant hopper, which can launch itself to 700 Gs in a fraction of a second. And its back legs need to extend at the same rate at the same time. And the creator of that plant hopper, the Lord Jesus Christ, equipped it with a set of gears. And the Bible says that when you see gears, it's clearly seen that there was a gear what? Maker. There was a gear maker. Evolutionary theory says you must suppress that very clear intuition. You must suppress it and say it, it only looks like it was designed, but it really wasn't. That their substitute agent, the natural selector, can act on creatures bringing about this design. The Bible says it's clearly seen, evolution suppresses it. So this is why it is incompatible with Christian faith. All of those reasons. Which then brings us to the third, which was really the first question, which hopefully we've answered. How do you interpret and understand Genesis 1 and 2? Hmm, hopefully now you're, you're equipped with some science that talks about how organisms adapt. Hopefully now you're equipped with reasons why evolutionary theory is fundamentally incompatible with Christian faith. So now the question is, how do you understand and interpret Genesis 1 and 2? Well, here's an answer for it. Genesis 1 and 2 are historical narratives. Not mytho-history, not partial history. They are real history. That's, that, that's, this is like a foot stomper. Boom, 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 boom. Genesis 1 and 2 are records of real history. Records of real history of what? The creation of the heaven and, and the earth and all of the living creatures. And how do I interpret those? Well, I give words their normal meaning in their normal context. That's how I interpret the Bible. I give words their normal meaning in their normal context. So, that's what I was taught at Moody when I look at Genesis 1-1 to 2-3, particularly their historical narratives. Historical narratives. In this phrase, these are the generations of, are repeated over and over and over again in the book of, of Genesis. Now, why do I give words their normal meaning in their normal context? That's called the normal method of interpretation because we do it in every other area of life. Okay, I went to medical school, physician, so I write these prescriptions for people. Now, with those with you with really highly evolved peepers, could read that on the screen. Probably you guys can read it up here on the front. This is for a medication. I'll just read it. A tenolol. It's a high blood pressure medication. The dosage, 150 milligrams. And how do I want you to take it? By mouth daily. You know, even most Texans can follow those directions <laughs> on that. A tenolol. A tenolol. 150 milligrams by mouth daily. So I give you this script. You take it to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist looks at your script, and he says, what does Dr. Galuza mean by mouth? <laughs> by mouth. By mouth. Mouth of a river, mouth of a cave. What's he talking about here? So he changes your script to say, a tenolol, 150 milligrams, by a natural opening daily. <laughs> On that. Hmm. Well, that's what a mouth is. In context, I'm talking about what? 
your mouth. That's how we give words their normal meaning in their normal context, and that's really important. Before I went to medical school, I was an engineer and I was in the Navy. I was stationed on a little island called Guam, and we had a, we had a barracks rehab project. And one of, the, one of the specifications said that the contractor during the rehab will repaint the rooms and apply two coats of paint. Apply two coats of paint. Well, we had a contractor came out. He applied one coat to all of the rooms and all of the barracks, demobilized and left. Huh. Well, we came out and we looked at this and we said, hey, Mr. Contractor, contractor shall apply two coats of paint. The contractor sent us back a letter and said, what the contract means is one coat thick enough to equal two coats of paint. And he had put on a really thick coat of paint. Huh. We responded to the contractor and we said, no, what the contract means is what? Two coats of paint. Wow. I mean, believe it or not, this went to court. This went to court, and, and who do you think won? The government or the contractor? Oh, see, you cynics. You think the contractor won, but the government won this one. This was a no-brainer for the government. And this is what the judge said. In contract law, words must be construed to their what? Normal meaning in the context of the specifications. Oh, here's the kicker. Otherwise, the intentions of either party becomes unknowable. That's why words must be given their normal meaning. If you can make the words say anything you want it to be, and you can make it say, we can make the Bible say what? Anything we want it to say. And if we do it with medicine, we do it with engineering, may I suggest we give words their normal meaning and their normal context so that the intentions of the Bible giver remain knowable. That's what we want. Do you realize the people who want to change the Bible and change their thinking are always going after the words? They say, I know that's what the word says, but this is what it really means. Just like the contractor did. Just like the contractor. Wrong O. I give the words their normal meaning. There's a reason for that, why it's not poetry or other kinds of things. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but they can actually look at the Hebrew grammar and there's certain characteristics which, pro which plot out as narrative passages. And they can look at Hebrew poetry and you get the same thing. And Genesis 1 very objectively plots out as an historical narrative, just like any other historical narrative in the Bible. But here's a very important reason for this, and it was, the, it was a very important reason in the Reformation. All of these leaders in the Reformation from Luther and Calvin and on, Reformed theology on that, but they held to one thing. The Bible was inherently clear. Because before the Reformation, you people in the pew were told by the church that the Bible was a mystical book and that you could not understand it for yourself. And that a clergyman, a clergyman had to come in, read the Bible, and tell you what it means. Do you know what that did? That put you in subjection not to the Bible, but to the what? To the clergyman. To the clergyman. The reformer said, wrong. The Bible is inherently clear, and here are some passages that we would support the fact that God says what he means, and he means what he says. All of these passages in John 15 and 16, we recognize where the Lord Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to do what? Lead you into all truth. All truth. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 right there, after the Lord spoke through Moses, giving him the, the law, he said, you don't have to go and get someone from across the sea and bring them to you to tell you what the book means. I'm paraphrasing here. He says, it's near you, it's in your heart. That means you can understand it. And in Acts chapter 17, when even the apostle Paul of all people came and spoke to the Bereans, the Bereans, the people in the pew, they checked what? The scriptures. 
to see if what Paul was saying is right. So clearly the people in the pew can read it for themselves and understand it for themselves. Why was this, a, why was this such an important issue to the reformers? Because it's an authority issue. It's an authority issue. This book is your authority, not the holy man. Not the holy man. So what they were saying is wrong. You do not need some religious authority to come in and tell you what the Bible says. Do you know what? We're facing a, re a re reformation issue today because now some people are saying, well, you don't need a holy man, but you need a science guy. You need a science guy to tell you what the Bible says. You can't understand it unless Stephen Hawking or Carl Sagan or their like and their view tell you what it means. There's even Christians who are saying this. What we would say as Christians is that is totally wrong. That that's what's leading, and I'm going to develop this more in Sunday school, that's what's leading to so many people leaving church today is this idea that the science guy has to tell you what the Bible says. We would say, no, you give a good copy of the scriptures even to Alka Indians who have never heard of Carl Sagan and they can read it and understand it for themselves. The Holy Spirit can enlighten their minds. That's really important. You know what? Your Christian ancestors died for that. They died for that thinking so that we were not under that kind of bondage. Well, here's another pushback. Some people say, you know, you, you creationists, you six-day creationists, you're making us look stupid in the eyes of the world, and it's really, really hurting evangelism. Totally wrong on that. This is a scientific study done by two seculars, one from Harvard University and one from the University of Indiana, where they looked at churches who have three different views of the Word of God. It is the inspired Word of God where people can understand it for themselves. Those people thought it was a book of fables on those areas, and inspired but not literal. In other words, you can make the words say whatever they mean. We would call them the liberal churches. They looked at these three different views and they looked at church attendance from 1990 to 2015 and guess what? The so-called liberal churches were hemorrhaging membership. It was they, those churches, who were accusing you of hurting evangelism, you of hurting the church, they were losing their members like droves. Solid Bible-believing churches were staying the same or growing. And a lot of those people who were leaving the liberal churches were leaving to a, to a category called no affiliation. No affiliation. So that silly canard about you saying stuff and driving people away from the church because supposedly we're silly is, is not even right scientifically. You know what that means? That means when people out there People out there in the world, they come through those doors and they come into this church. They don't want to hear the same malarkey which they're listening to out here. They want to come here and hear something different. Amen. That's what they want. They want people to come in here who will teach truth unapologetically and not worried about it. And that's what this church does. They want to hear a different voice and a different sound on all of those things. Now, where can you get more information about this? This is just a little commercial here. We have a free magazine, and it's been free for 50 years, 50 years, called Acts and Facts. We have donors which give to us so that people can get this magazine for free. This magazine will keep you current on the science. It has free articles every month, and parents, you need this for your kids. Grandparents, you need it for your grandkids. We will mail it to you absolutely free. So all you have to do is just sign up, get on it, and we will mail it to you. We've recently begun producing these YouTube videos. I'm not much of a social media person myself, but a lot of you are. And they are incredibly good. In fact, we just produced one called Adam or Apes. It is really technically excellent, really good pushing back against that whole eight man thing. Please subscribe to these and you can see these on YouTube or you can pick them up here. I, I know that you probably are convinced you'll remember everything I say, you know, but I know you won't. 
So please equip yourself with the resources that are over here. I guarantee you we're not funding our ministry with it. They're to help equip you and your kids so they don't get swept away. And then the last and final concluding idea of why I give words their normal meaning in their normal context is because the Lord Jesus did. The Apostle Paul did. When someone asked the Lord Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Do you remember what he said? He begins by saying, have you not what? Read. Have you not read? Have you not read? And then he quotes from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. From the beginning of creation, not after many, many millions of years, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast, or as the King James says, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He believed in this creation. He believed it was recent. He believed there was a real Adam and a real Eve. He believed that the Lord brought them together in marriage. He believed everything that Genesis 1 and 2 taught. He gave words their normal meaning in their normal context. And then the Apostle Paul, speaking of the resurrection of the dead, he's contrasting a first Adam and a second Adam. He says, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He believed in a real Adam as really portrayed in Genesis 1. But, the, but he's also laying out something that's really important here. He's saying there's only two groups of people, only two groups of people on this planet. And it's not rich people and poor people. It's not black people and white people. It's not any of these superficial distinctions which we have. He says there's only two groups of people. The first group is everybody who is in Adam in Adam. If you are born into this world, you are born into Adam. That means you are born into death. You are born into sin. You are separated from the love of God. In other words, you're lost. You're lost. So if you are in Adam, you are lost. The second group of people are those who are in Christ, who have been born again, regenerated from the inside out, supernaturally, who are no longer dead and separated from God, but have been made new and made close and placed into the family. So this is an important question, even more important than the ones that we already covered. Where are you today? Where are you today? Are you still in Adam or are you in Christ? Hopefully I've given you many reasons, even scientific reasons, why you should not doubt the Bible, you should not doubt its, its claims about Christ, and you should come to Christ today. You should come to Christ. If you come to Christ today, He will give you life because Jesus is the life giver. Come to Christ today. I'm not a member of this church, but I can speak on behalf of this church, and He will give you life. Well, there's three answers to three key questions. The fourth one is out there. Thank you very much for your time.